Holding my chest. My legs and hands. Silence. Feeling the pressure. What? She was a fool. It's a million bloody degrees out there. Oh, wind. I'm sorry if I said anything awful. Blessed lambs, of course. Why hadn't he got up to chop the capsicum? I was never a good reader. Ah, Immaculately bland. Anyway, it looks like... What do we do with this now? You're not even supposed to use the word fat. Boys like girls. When we were very young... I was back home in Norwich. Square Sound. You're listening to the audiobook podcast for the makers and listeners of audiobooks. Hello and welcome back to the audiobook podcast recorded from Square Sound Studios in Melbourne. I'm Justine sloan Lees, and I'm in the booth today with Ryan De Silva and Yen Yuin. So great for the three of us to be on this side of the glass because we're normally mostly all on the other side of the glass. Mm. This is true. Does it feel odd? Yes. I've never, I've never done a podcast before. so It's my first time as well. Oh my God, you guys are a rare breed. <laughs> so tell us a bit about yourselves. My name's Ryan De Silva. I've been an audiobook director here at Square Sound for about two years. I've been working in audiobooks for probably four or five years now, and I've got a 10 plus year background in music production and performance. And Yen? Uh, my name's Yen Nguyen. I did my first audiobook about nine years ago now um, and spent a good five years not only recording audiobooks but in a head producer role, so casting and project managing and booking studios and, and all that side of things as well, um, dealing with publishers and, and authors directly and that side. I think part of the impetus for this discussion was over the last, say, decade or so with the real explosion in audiobooks and podcasting and then with COVID in 2020 where everyone was doing the famous pivot. It seems like every second studio in town now has a shingle up saying, we direct audiobooks. And do they? Because it's a very specialised industry. I got a LinkedIn request recently from some young guy who said, you know, sound engineer, audiobook director. And I scratched around on the internet and I could find no proof that he'd ever worked on an audiobook. And it's like, well, you know, I don't know if you can call yourself an audiobook director if you've never done it. So just really wanted to sort of hone in on who's who in the studio and what you get if you go to a studio. And I want to play you something that I think it'll be a good laugh, but also give you an idea of why this is an important question, we think. So this is Benedict Cumberbatch, generally considered one of the world's finest thespians and also an audiobook narrator. I think I looked on Audible, he had about 40 to his name. On the Couch with Graham Norton. Now, Benedict, every time you're on the show, mm. we get uh, so many messages and tweets and emails right. of all the questions we had. Yeah. The one that came up most often was, <laughs> ask Benedict to say the word penguin. <laughs> <laughs> What is this about? Well, apparently I got it wrong repeatedly in a documentary. <laughs> it wasn't a documentary about said animal. It was, uh, it was a documentary about, I think about the South Pacific in general. And now I'm completely terrified of the word. Um, I don't go near it. Well, no, because I know, here's the thing. I thought, oh, I'm and sure yeah. they're making it up. But we actually looked You've got at it? this documentary. Oh, good. So the documentary is called... Good. The documentaries are called Strange Islands. The first one you sort of get away with, and then after that you lose all sense of what the world is. Let's have a look. Listen carefully. And the last thing you might expect to see here is penguins. <laughs> These are Fiordland crested penguins, named after this corner of South New Zealand. So why are these woodlands so attractive to penguins? A freshwater stream through the forest makes a handy highway for a parent penguin heading home from a fishing trip. What is the... You know, the funny thing is, you don't you don't do this in isolation. You have a, you have a team of you know natural history experts based in Bristol, funded by you, the tax-paying public. <laughs> It's not just me sitting there in a booth going, oh, I, I think I know how to say penguin, I'll say penguins. <laughs> it's mortifying. But there are other people who should take some flack, including my producer. You and a booth with a bottle of vodka. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. 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 But did yeah. no, one, did no one at the end of the thing, could we just try the word penguin again? <laughs> may, may, maybe, maybe, maybe. <laughs> maybe they just gave up. <laughs> I honestly don't know. But then what I love is, in the way that life is, mm. how special that Benedict is now starring oh, yeah. as a wolf yeah. in this film. <laughs> <laughs> so, can 
can you say it now? Well, I've had a word with Disney. I just, I need to check that I have said it correctly in the film. <laughs> uh, e penguin. Gwyn. No, penguin. Penguin! Yeah. Penguin! Yeah. Yeah. So I think the point is, you know, Benedict says, you're not doing this in isolation. You know, he was in a voiceover booth doing that narration. Who was on the other side of the glass? And what were they doing when Benedict was saying penguins, which, by the way, is what all we say in our household now, penguins, because it's so catchy. So you don't create an audiobook in a vacuum. When people listen to audiobooks, you rarely have individuals named as producers or directors or engineers. You might have the studio name. So if someone's going to be paying money to have an audiobook produced... They want to know who they're getting. So why don't we talk about sound engineers, mm. which you both are, mm. and I'm not. Yeah, well, you are a very competent director, though, and that's sort of where your background started. I think the fundamental difference is that one is focused on sound and the other is not so sound focused and more focused on performance. Mm. And they're definitely separate disciplines and... I think when it comes to recording an audiobook, I think the discipline of directing is much more conducive to a really good final product than sound engineering because especially if you come from a music background, like if you learnt, you know, a lot of these skills from, say, a music background, then you're probably used to recording, you know, 32 channels of audio at once or something like this, while an audiobook is just one, maybe two microphones at once. So there's not a whole lot to do once you get the initial setting. It's pretty much a set and forget um, mm. notion for yeah. the whole audiobook. So I don't know if you're a sound engineer wanting to constantly tweak, it's just not necessary. You need to be more focused on the performance. Yeah, very much agree. I think um, even just from the name engineering, it's it's a very technical role traditionally. And I think, as you say, in music, there's a lot more complexity about dealing with multiple channels and phasing between microphones and, and all of that kind of thing. And it's really not something that you're usually dealing with on an audio book. It's much more about capturing a single performance in a, a single microphone, a single actor. So definitely a very different skill set to recording a band, typically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember a few years ago there was a young uh, team member in our parent company, Sound Firm, and she'd done an audio engineering course only because she didn't meet the height requirements for NASA, which was what she really <laughs> wanted to do. Uh, and she was really brilliant, really brilliant. And one day she said, can I just come in and observe a session with you? I'd like to see what you do. And I was like, sure thing. So she just sat down for a couple of hours watching the session and then at one point the talent said, look, I might just go to the toilet. And Frances said to me, I get what you're doing here. I see exactly what you're doing here. I'm like, oh, really? What <laughs> is it? And she said, it's not about this. And she's pointing at the Pro Tools session on the computer and the mixing desk. She said, it's about this, pointing to me and the booth. She said, it's about the relationship. Mm. And she said, I know... So many of the guys I studied with are real tech geeks and they love the gear and the faders and the knobs and the plugins and all that kind of stuff, but they don't know how to work with people. Mm. Even though technically they're more than capable of recording a single voice, they actually don't have the directorial people skills to be able to nurture a performance. Mm. Yeah, I think there's so much to be said about rapport in the studio on an audio book. I see such an important part is just putting the, the narrator at ease and making them feel comfortable to give their best performance, especially if you're meeting them on the day. One of the most important things for me on the first day is, is trying to crack through, break the ice and just put them at ease and let them know I'm not judging them, I'm there to support them. And to trust you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that's really important mm. because... They're then relying on you to help them shape their performance mm. and pick them up if they've made a mistake, you know, all that kind of thing. Mm. Especially with first-time narrators. Usually I like to take five or ten minutes even of the first session just talking them through what to expect, what's, you know, normal, because most of them are absolutely mortified by the amount of mistakes that they're making mm. when you as a director know that it's completely normal mm. and just trying to balance always thinking about their headspace and, you know, what they would be thinking. And there is, yeah, a level of, I guess, 
emotional intelligence, let's call it, that you have to have to be able to manage getting the best performance out of someone that you might not need to, you know, track 32 mics at once or something Mm. that a sound engineer would be really proficient at. As we said earlier, you guys are engineers. I'm not. I mean, I've come through radio and I have learned the technical skills necessary to do the work I do at any point. And we have a studio set up here that's very streamlined and we have a template that's set up that's very streamlined. So it's very easy for me. And unless something goes really wrong, and even then we've got such a good troubleshooting system that it's not too often I have to ring our wonderful helper, Owen, and go, Owen, I can't get the EU controller to speak to the avid and I can't remember how you showed me to fix it last time. That's happen occasionally. But I guess for me, directing is my skill and working with people. And I think how I came to be at this point, I've always been a massive reader. I think if you are asked to record an audio book and you never read a book yourself, you probably have to ask yourself if it's something you should really do. Mm. Probably have a reasonable general knowledge. I think that's really mm. kind of helpful. And also just to know when to ask questions and when you should be curious about something. So just an example from the book I've just completed, the narrator read out the name of the capital of the state of North Carolina in the US. And I stopped her and I said, hey, I know it looks straightforward, R-A-L-E-I-G-H, but how do Americans say it? And she said, oh, isn't it rally? I mean, I just thought it was rally. But then again, I'm English, so I think of Sir Walter Rally. And I said, well, let's check. And it's rawly. Mm. So even just thinking, I wonder how Americans say that. Do they say it how we presume they say it? Mm. So just knowing when to ask questions and check things out, I think is really important part of the skill of a director. Mm. Yeah, I'd say it's it's kind of a a first point of feedback on the performance and and kind of taking the role of what is the general audience going to think when they hear that and trying to, to ask the questions that other people might ask if they hear something pronounced like that. And I think particularly on pronunciation, there's, there's interesting things in, in the English language if we do have different pronunciations depending on class and geographic location and all these different things. And so it does depend on the context of the book too. Who is the character saying it? Um, how would that character say it? Because there, there could be three different ways of saying the same word depending on who's saying it. Mm. Yeah, we did a book last year that was um, an Australian title, but we were producing it for an American audiobook publisher. I'm not quite sure how that came to be, but that was the case. So the files we were recording were going to the US for um, the quality control check and post-production. And so we had to explain to them that for reasons that no one is really clear on, Australians say maroon and not maroon as everyone else in the world says. So we literally had to email saying, don't send it back for a pickup. This is really, truly how Australians say this colour. Yeah, I actually had one just come up on the book I've been doing, which is Furori, which is furor in the US. And I've always kind of known it as the the US pronunciation, but I I learned on this one that it is actually furori in in the English pronunciation. Spelt the same way. Spelt exactly the same way. Or it's like, I think, you know, the Americans have aluminum and we have aluminium and those kinds of things. Oh, like like ballet, you know, all those things where Mm. they hit the second syllable in America. Mm. I think another word that you hear a lot is producer. And in different contexts, producers mean different things. From my experience working at the ABC, I created content, but I was called a producer. Here, we use the word director and producer is the person who's organising everything and not necessarily being involved in the actual direction of books. So what do you guys think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it gets interesting in, in audio because I think a lot of it comes from the music world. Um, and in the music world, when you have a, a producer, when you think of Brian Eno or... Um, Gosh, I'm just forgetting people's names right now. Who's the wall of sound guy? Um, Phil Phil Spector. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Any of these guys, they really are more directors in the film sense, that they're they're more about guiding performance and also guiding the creative um, direction or or overall kind of sound and timbre of of a a performance. Whereas, yeah, in film or theatre and things, a producer tends to be more of a project manager which probably makes a lot more sense. It probably makes a lot more sense to say a a director is a person who's giving a creative direction, whereas a producer is really a project manager. But I think um, those terms get very mixed over because we're working in audio books and because that then takes a lot from the music world, where a music producer 
kind of is a director. Mm. Yeah, I mean, well said. Mm. Yeah, so our producer here is Marianne, who's uh, amazing at keeping lots of balls in the air all at the same time and really gets everything happening is the first port of call for people who may not have any experience in the audiobook industry looking to either become a narrator or to have their own book produced. We do do a lot of author-direct content here. So she could be doing anything from casting to budgets to scheduling to, to sometimes more creative stuff when we have stuff with sound effects and so on. So part of the skill, I think, for a good producer is being able to see where the project needs to go and getting involved right from the start and making creative decisions, like even just casting, that's Mm. a creative decision in and of itself Mm. because that's going to shape the performance. But some of the more complex things we do, Ryan, I think... Yeah, we did a book with Zoe Foster-Blake, a book called Back to Sleep. And obviously as a director on the day, you're trying to get the best performance from the narrator on the day, but you don't really have the opportunity to make too many wild creative decisions on the fly because they might not be too well thought out or might feel good at the moment and you can sometimes take it in a great direction, sometimes not so great direction. So we try to have all those big creative decisions handled beforehand and that's sometimes also where a producer, Marianne in this instance, decided on some pretty significant sound design directions all beforehand um, so we knew exactly what to capture in the studio on the day, any overdubs, any background noises. So that's where Marianne can cross over into more of a creative hands-on role with the end product instead of strictly budgets and and, <laughs> and organising people. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think looking at the producer from a project manager point of view, there's definitely still a lot of creativity in that role in audiobooks and certainly yeah, choosing the voice actors, choosing the, the directors or the engineers and really determining the scope of the project and especially in terms of things like children's books, like is this going to be something where we're going to be putting music and sound design and sound effects through it? That all comes from the producer rather than the director because I guess that falls into that project manager role of determining the scope and the team that's going to be involved in it. But certainly there can be a lot of crossover between director, engineer and producer, particularly when you've got smaller budgets or smaller teams. And also it's great for them to be able to jump in and work out if some ideas are actually achievable Mm. is another good thing. Yeah. We want this, that and that. Can we actually pull that off? Mm. Or do we have the budget? Mm. (laughs) Exactly, yeah. Well, speaking of budgets, it's interesting because we've been doing work for a number of major US audiobook publishers and they seem to have much more budget for certain, I would say, high profile titles. Ryan, you're working on one at the moment and I'm going to be doing one shortly where there's a director, an engineer and an editor attached to the project and the producer who's coordinating those three people. Mm. So that's quite a different model. Normally here in Australia in the audiobook industry, it's generally the person who records it who does the final editing. And in most cases, we do destructive drop-in edits as we record. So you come to the end of a recording session with a file that is pretty much complete. And then later on, it'll be maybe fine edited. In the middle, there's the quality control. And I know we've talked about this in some of our earlier podcasts, but what that person does is they get the files three of us take out of the studio. They listen through with headphones, with the script, and they prepare a spreadsheet with anything that they think detracts from the listening experience. So that can be technical So those ugly lip smacks we all hate, the cut-off breaths where there's been a drop-in edit, fluctuations in levels, you know, things that are too hot, things that are too low. And they can also be textual, so they relate to the text, so inconsistent character voices, mispronunciations, all that kind of thing. And then that's when we come on board with that spreadsheet to do that final editing. And I'd have to say, isn't it great for developing your fine editing skills, some Mm. of the saves you can do? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I would say that that is where more of the, I guess, advanced editing skills um, come into play. There's much more audio engineering practices that come into play in the editing stage, post-production stage of an audiobook than in the actual session, which um, 
yeah, I guess goes back to that thing of you really want to be a really good director in the session instead of an audio engineer. Mm-hmm. If you just like audio engineering, get into audiobook editing. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah. But I yeah. think it's also where the roles can kind of cross over a bit because I think from doing editing, you get a better sense of what you can let go and what you need to fix in the studio as mm-hmm. well because those two things keep going back and forth, I think. And, you know, the more audiobooks you do, the more you get the sense of, oh, that will be an easy edit later. Yeah. And I, I don't want to interrupt the actor's performance because mm-hmm. I can just fix that without causing any problems later. But I will interrupt on this instance because that I'm not going to be able to edit. Yeah. yeah. And I guess that comes back to that emotional intelligence to know, like, should I get this perfect, script perfect, or should I fix it later? What's the vibe? What's the energy in the mm. studio? How are they going to take to me stopping them for the third mm. time for that little T on the end when mm. I could maybe just sub that in later? Mm. I'm also of the opinion that if I don't think something was really perfect, then like that's just my opinion and a proofer is going to listen to it as well. So I think if it's passed through me, the narrator and the proofer, then there probably isn't a problem. Yeah. And when you're talking about recording a 12-hour book, at the end of the day, you do have a timeline that you need to get through. So you need to pick your battles for sure. I mean, I'm sure we'll all agree that audiobooks, it's a pretty low margin industry and there just isn't the time to finesse something the way you would if it was a feature film with a budget of $10 million. Mm. It's, as you said, Yen, letting go. It's fine. And then you think about the context. Most people listen to audiobooks. You know, they're in earbuds on the tram in the car. And yeah, sure, there's a tiny bit of clothing rustle under there, but I don't think anyone else is going to hear Mm. that when they're just listening. And they're in the story, you know, because we have to be in the story, but also sit back a bit to be attentive to all those little fine details. But honestly, when someone's just listening to something for enjoyment, they're not distracted by the things that we're paid to be distracted by. Mm. They're just in the zone. So he's just like, yep, that's fine. And that's also how I have learned to listen to it like I've bought the book and I'm listening to it as a consumer for the first time. And if something, if I would want to, you know, jump in from a consumer point of view and be like, oh, I'd really wish they slowed down to let that idea sink in or, God, this is dragging a little bit or can I hear something in the background there? Then that's when I jump in and try and change things. Because if I go too fine tooth comb, you know, it's going to affect the energy in the studio and run two or three times longer than it should. Mm. I think that's one of the things about if you go with a studio that doesn't have experience directing audio books, all these things we've talked about, but also quality control proofing process in place that we have. We know it's important to have that second set of ears across something we've recorded and then to come back to us for that final edit. But I think a lot of studios would just say, oh, we can just record, do punch record, and then we'll listen back and check the edit and it'll be fine. But you have to be so attentive to detail and it's really easy. It's really easy to get oral fatigue as well as mental fatigue. And sometimes when I look at QC notes, I think, how did I not notice that in the studio? But it just takes that split second of distraction. Something's gone on outside and you're thinking, oh, what was that noise, you know? And something can go through that really needed to be fixed. So that is a potential problem when you go to a studio that isn't experienced with audiobooks that they don't quite realise how much attention to detail is required. Yeah, and if they don't have the QC systems in place to catch all of those, which we definitely do. Mm. And the other thing too is that Audible will give out specs about how you deliver files and things, but they're very precise. And yes, sure, an experienced engineer will be able to make sense of them. But I can tell you, if they're not right according to specs, you get back an email saying this title has been mothballed. So you really want to know what you're doing. Do we know where the term mothballed comes from? I don't know, but it's terrifying, isn't it? I was just wondering if that analogy rings true. (laughs) It's maybe about being like put in storage in the cupboard, you know, and you put mothballs in your clothes to stop the moths eating at them if you've got all your winter clothes in a trunk somewhere. Right. So I think it's like they've put it away in a trunk. In the audible Like your old, yeah. And if you work for lots of different production houses, everyone's got a slightly different labelling protocol and then other people have different what they want you to send them. So there could be weeks where I could be round talking to Owen in the transfer room. Owen's our wonderful back-end guy and say, oh, Owen, can you do that flat conversion for Toronto and the daisy conversion for VA and the waves are ready for London, but the MP3s have to go to Adelaide. And he's like, yep, onto it. You know, there's a lot of back-end detail that you need Mm. to get right and that not all studios Mm. will realise. Yeah, I think... um 
I mean, again, coming to big differences with music and, and audio books. When people are dealing with music or music studios are used to recording music, you're typically, you know, the average song, three, three and a half minutes. So you can really kind of drill down on this, this one thing, whereas obviously audiobooks are, are 10 hours on average for, for an adult title. Um, so there's a very different process. You can't just have one person kind of overseeing that. You need to have more people on it. You can't do multiple takes of everything. You can't just go, oh, I'm going to edit this later because you end up editing 10 hours of multiple takes is just mm -hmm. impossible. Mm -hmm. Whereas, yeah, in music, three minutes of multiple takes is very, very manageable. And similarly, you, you don't tend to have to deal with all of those different formats like how you're going to cut it for CD, how you're going to cut it for digital. It's, it's kind of one, one size fits all in music, whereas when you're dealing with audiobooks, it's a whole bunch of, of different file deliveries depending on who you're sending to and that kind of thing. So before we finish off, guys, how do you feel about being audiobook directors? Is it something that you think is a really fulfilling career? I mean, my favourite things about it, I think, uh, you develop quite a, an intimate relationship, I think, with the narrator when you're in the studio. Typically, even if you have separate directors, engineers, you're doing this long form content where it's a small team, typically you and the narrator, maybe, maybe a third person in the studio over a course of days. And, you know, you're essentially reading a lot of books <laughs> and it gives you a lot to connect with people over, I think, when you're listening to the book and you can kind of stop and have a moment to kind of chat with the narrator about, wow, you know, that really impacted me or I really related to, to that chapter for these reasons. And again, I think those are the things for me that I find really help to, to break the ice and, and build that rapport with the narrator. Yeah, I really enjoy it. And probably for the reason that I've always loved jobs where you can, you know, it's not a static job. You can always refine your processes to get the best out of someone. There's also, there's always things you, I pick up from a narrator, whether it's, you know, for one narrator, I found out to get the best performance, I actually wouldn't tell them what they did wrong. I would actually just say, let's take this line again. Mm. And I found that they would just automatically subconsciously fix any error. And mm. I found, well, that's great because over 10 hours, you don't want to be told, so this is what you did wrong. And this is what you did wrong. It's like kind of shoving yeah. your face in your yeah, mistake yeah. Mm. every time. So I adopted that maybe two years ago and I use that for every narrator now. So you mm. can always refine your processes. And I think with audiobook directing, it is about getting the best out of people. Mm. Actually, that, that reminds me of a narrator that something I learned from them was to get their consistent character voices, they would actually cast the book and say, okay, well, this guy is Clint Eastwood mm -hmm. and this guy is, um, I'm having name blanks again, um, <laughs> but, you know, but casting all the characters with real life actors. So they had a reference in their head immediately of like, all right, this guy's Clint Eastwood. Every time he comes on, that's what I think of in my head. And that's how I do that voice. Yes. Yes. That's quite a common hack, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you, Yen. I originally wanted to work in film and TV production, but I got a job in radio and I just stayed because it's a small team. It's the intimacy. Mm. And now I think if I was on a set and I had to stand around while some grip, you know, adjusted something for 15 minutes and trying to maintain energy, my boredom threshold, I couldn't cope. You know, I loved the small team and just working intensely, you know, with a, one or two people. Mm. I find it really rewarding. Mm. Mm. And then to have such a, a range of personalities as well from book to book and a range of, of content from book to book that, you know, you can be doing a really dark book one day and then doing a really happy, fun children's book the next day. And we have to be honest and say some books just are dull. Mm, that's <laughs> I mean, true, yes. it's not all, you know thrilling and fun and wonderful that some books you go, you know what, this is just something I have to do. And that's when you remind yourself that you could be working as a clerk in the tax office mm. or you could be doing something like this, which feels like a bit of a privilege. Mm. Yeah, I get that asked by a lot of narrators, you know, what was what's the worst book you ever did? <laughs> and to me, it doesn't matter too much about the book. It's always about the relationship between you and the narrator. You could be working on a rubbish title, but the way you've kept the energy high in the room yeah. and you've had that personal contact and you've connected, it actually makes it a great experience for the narrator yeah. and the director. So yeah, I think it's all just about nurturing those relationships mm. and that is so far from sound engineering. Mm. That's a nice wrap, Ryan. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> You've been listening to the audiobook podcast brought to you by Square Sound. 
If there's something that we haven't covered in our audiobook series that you'd like to know about, send us a message at studio.squaresound.com.au. The audiobook podcast was produced by Marianne Plaza together with Abby Holmes and Justine Sloan Lees. With special thanks to all our guest speakers, Square Sound is an audiobook and podcast studio in Melbourne, Australia. Thanks for listening. Is it Yen Nguyen? The reason it's tricky is because, like, English language we don't have. Have that sound. Well, it's like it's soft sounds. Yeah, like yeah. everything we always say, like, uh, n, but it's like a mm sound at the start. So it's, it's kind of like. Like penguin. <laughs> it is. It is a little bit. It's like it's like the end of that. So it's like if you said song, it's like mm. Yeah. So it's like mm, win, basically. Win.